Excellent. Well, uh, as Neil mentioned, we were roommates. I've known him longer than I've known my wife. We've uh, been good friends, fast friends. He was at my bachelor party along with his brother as well. So uh, honored to be here today. Thank you, Pastor John, for letting me to share on this pulpit. Uh, open your Bibles to Psalm 127, as Pastor Neil mentioned. The title of today's message is Arrow, Arrow. We're going to be looking at a really famous passage in Scripture. I thought it particular important since we do our, we are celebrating families of faith this weekend. Uh, so looking forward to that. My name is Nate, as has been mentioned. I pastor a church in California called Anthem Chapel. We believe God's given us a vision to proclaim the name of Jesus, that all would look to him and be saved. Our desire is to learn how to love and live like Jesus, which is your desire as well. That's what we're doing here, right? We don't have to be here. We get to be here on a Sunday morning. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, hey, today's a good day to be in church. And turn to the other side and say, because you're sitting next to me. That's right. That's right. All right. 127. Let's read this. A few verses here. I'm reading out the ESV version. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows, there's our kind of theme here, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. This is God's word for us this morning. Would you join me as we pray over our time together? Father, we thank you uh, for the privilege we have to uh, gather in this place, Coastline Calvary Chapel here in Gulf Breeze, Florida. Uh, Thank you for the men and women, young and old, single, married, retired, that have gathered here at 930. Uh, Lord, we desire to hear your word, not my word, but your word spoken into this place. And so for those that need encouragement, would you give it? Uh, Those Those that need direction, would you give it? Those that need correction, would you bring it? Lord, we want to hear from you, Lord. We desire, we need a word from God today. We want to encounter you, the risen Lord. So would you speak to us? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If I was to be jerked off this stage because I was talking too long and I only had one sentence to say, only one last thing for you to remember, the bottom line, if it were, of this morning's sermon, it would be this. Uh, The Lord gives rest to those who trust. The Lord gives rest to those who trust. I want you to observe verses 1 and 2 in Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early, go to late to bed, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Now you saw that in this text. Vain, vain, vain. Three times in two verses, this word repeated. In the Hebrew, this word vain, it means, uh, it means empty. It means pointless. It means worthless. And then this phrase, um, anxious toil, anxious toil, that's the same uh, Hebrew word in the Garden of Eden in Genesis when Adam and Eve are cursed because of sin for disobedience. It's the idea of, of, of burden, of toil, of pain, of hardship. So Solomon is writing this psalm, Psalm 127. He's the author. And like his father, David, he's a poet. He's writing, he's painting a picture for us. And he's saying, hey, we, there's, a, there's a way to build, there's a way to labor that's pointless. There's a way to keep watch, to be alert, that's worthless. There's a way to rise up early and go to bed late that's meaningless. In other words, There's a way to live your life that it's vanity, pointless, wasteless, worthless, meaningless. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live like that. I don't want that to be a characteristic of my life. So so how would you get there? 
I mean, how would you live a wasted, meaningless life? Well, you see that there here in the phrase, unless the Lord, unless the Lord. So how to live a meaningless life? It's to work without depending upon God. It's to toil without trusting in the Lord. To live life like it all depends upon you. You've got to fix it. You've got to solve it. You've got to control it. You've got to make it happen. And all that type of attitude leads to an anxious life, right? Unless the Lord is in it, it's useless to do it. Now, here's the fact. If you and I were over at uh, the shop right there next to Inner Light, and we were having a cup of coffee, a really tasty cup of coffee, and, uh, you know, you don't really know me, but maybe through a little bit of the coffee, we were hanging, we are talking, maybe we became a little transparent. And if we were to be real with each other, you might say, listen, listen, I don't really, I find myself not needing help from God. I, I can do it all on my own. And maybe you're even here today and you're exploring Christianity or you just got invited to come to church today and maybe you would say the same thing, like I can do some stuff on my own, like I know how to build and I know how to labor and I know how to watch. In fact, if you were to think about the success that you enjoy right now, it's because you did it. You stayed up late and you climbed the ladder and you worked hard and you're successful. But again, we're having coffee, we're having an intimate moment and and maybe I could ask some follow-up questions. Would I maybe ask, well, who gave you the mind to study? Right? Who, who gave you the actual ability to climb up the ladder of success? Who gave you the, the lungs to breathe and the heart to pump blood through your body? So the Bible is saying the success that you enjoy today, it actually comes from the Lord. And you would say, but yeah, I know plenty of successful CEOs and business owners that are godless and Christless. What the scripture is telling us is that that might be the case, but in the end, it's pointless, wasted, meaningless. Unless the Lord is in it, it's useless to do it. In fact, if you, like I mentioned, Solomon wrote Psalm 127. He writes another book called Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, he talks about this very idea, like I did a lot of stuff, Solomon's saying. I, no pleasure did I withhold, right? He had hundreds of wives. I mean, he had it all. And at the end, he would say everything was meaningless. Unless the Lord is in it, it was useless to do it. And I would say most of us in this place believe in God. We have a trust in the Lord. Amen to that. But if I were to look at your Google calendar and look at things that you have lined up and I were to pull up just a straight up atheist, godless person's calendar, how different would they look, I wonder? Are you toiling without trusting? How often do you go about your day without, without spending time to adjust your heart and express your need and desire for God's help? So you might say, well, how, how would you know? What's the litmus test to see if you're, if you're trusting in the Lord? Right, because God gives rest to those who trust. Well, I were to ask you another question. How many of you stay up late at night worried about things, anxious about things? Because the scripture says that those that are depending upon themselves are eating the bread of anxious toil. There's even a, an author, I'm going to actually see him, he's coming to Santa Barbara, he wrote a book called The Anxious Generation, right? Like, we're an anxious people. We worry, we stress. Teenagers anxious about the first day of school or what their friends are going to think about them. College students anxious about getting a job and paying off school debt. Singles worried and anxious about not being single anymore. Parents anxious about their kids, employees anxious about their job, grandparents anxious about their health. Like if we're not careful, our lives can look just like the godless world around us, working without dependence, toiling without trust, eating the bread of anxious toil. When we're faced with a problem, we immediately try to figure it out instead of looking to Jesus, Jesus first looking to him, trusting in him, all eyes on Christ. 
Right? The Bible's not saying don't toil, don't work hard. We understand that. Whatever our hands find to do, do it with all our might. But a life that trusts is a life that says, Lord, I, I'm waking up. I, I can't, but you can. The Lord gives rest to those who trust. Reminding ourselves daily of John 15, apart from the Lord, I can do nothing. So there's a way to build knowing God is building. There's a way to watch knowing God is watching. There's a way to, 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 to work knowing God is working alongside. God, the Lord gives rest to those who trust. Look at verse two. It says, it's vain that you rise up early, go to late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. I mean, what a, what a word that is. He gives, God gives to his beloved sleep. Meaning just that, he gives rest to those who trust. Another way to read this is the New American Standard Version says it like this. He gives to his beloved even in his sleep. That's kind of a cool way to think about it. In other words, God can perform more good for those who are trusting in him while they're sleeping than we can perform on our own, working as hard as we can. So do you trust him? I have a little acronym. I got to be like Pastor Neil a little bit here. Trust, T-R-U-S-T. Trust, total reliance upon the sovereignty of the Lord. Trust, total reliance upon the sovereignty of the Lord. Lord. Now, why do we trust? Why would we trust the Lord? What does he call us there in verse two? He gives to his beloved rest, beloved sleep, beloved. I mean, God loves you, church. He loves you. You're his beloved. Now, listen, you don't get this type of language in any other religion. The Hindu gods, Hindu gods don't love their people. Islam, Allah does not love his people. You don't find this kind of language in the Quran. But the God of the Bible, infinite, no boundaries, no limits, doesn't experience things in sequence, eternal, unchangeable. His wisdom, his power, his justice, his compassion, his goodness, his holiness, his truth. That God says he addresses you as his beloved. Wow. God gives rest to those who trust. That's why we trust. That's why we can totally rely upon the sovereignty of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 11, the people are building, building, working, working, brick upon brick, building a tower. But God wasn't in it. And God comes down and strikes the work, stops the work, stops the progress and scatters the people. And one chapter later, Genesis chapter 12, God sees one man, Abram, and he says, I can use this one guy who's going to trust me, who's going to place faith in me, and I can start a movement with this one man who trusts. You can accomplish more in 10 minutes in dependence upon God than a lifetime in independence from him. And if you really believe that, I, I believe it could really change the way you live. The Lord gives rest to those who trust. Now, as Solomon's painting this picture of trust. Verse 3 is this hinge verse. Verse 3 really is maybe a verse that we're familiar with, but it's the, the hinge verse on this whole morning. Verse 3 says this, Behold, the children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Now look at the text there. It says, Behold. Now, whenever you see that in Scripture, wherever you see it, it means it's like a, like a stop sign or like a speed bump. Like, hey, watch out. Behold. Pay attention here. What I'm about to say is important. Solomon's writing this. He's a poet. He's painting a picture. He's painting a picture about trusting the Lord in work and building in all aspects of life. And in fact, verse one, when it says, unless the Lord builds the house, the word there for house, um, one way to interpret it is a physical house. Another way to think about that word is a household or a dynasty, a dynasty. In fact, the Hebrew word for son and daughter and house, it's the same root word, bana, which means to build. Because sons and daughters build a household like bricks and stone build an actual house. So for our last portion of our time this morning, we're going to look at five principles in building a family. But before I do, I just want to encourage you here this morning. 
This is a Families of Faith weekend. We had a great event on Friday night, a great time with the men on Saturday morning, and here we are Sunday. I want to let you know that pouring into and raising up the next generation is not just something God gives parents to do, but to the Christian community. In fact, if you were to do a Bible study on all the verses that relate to parenting, they weren't given to just parents, but to the Christian community at large. In fact, Psalm 127, if you saw the superscription above the psalm, it says a psalm of Solomon, a song of ascents, which means this was a song that was sung by the community of Israel as they approached Jerusalem to worship God. So everybody was singing this song. Right, Because we're part of two families. My last name is Wagner. My biological family is Wagners. We were, I was born in Port Arthur, Texas. Lived there for 10 years. So I'm a little bit familiar with the Gulf Coast. Gulf shrimp, I've been having those every day so far. Woo, Gulf shrimp are good. You can't beat that. California shrimp got nothing on the Gulf shrimp. If my last name was Spencer, I would either be the mayor of this town or a surfer or a pastor. I'd have a little statue at the beach to myself. <laughs> Spencers are very, you know, very, you know, well known here, okay? And, uh, but the eternal family, the eternal family, we're united by Christ. We're the faith family. So church, we're all a part of investing in the next generation. Why? Verse three, because children, they're a heritage Children, they're a gift. They're a reward. Do you know that your kids' ministry here is larger than most churches in the nation? Your kids' ministry. That's that's not a burden. That's a blessing. And so I, I pray for Coastline. I pray for the culture here that they're not begging you to serve like it's a like a burden to endure, but like a blessing to pursue. Aunt and uncles here, pour in and invest in your nieces and nephews. Grandparents, pour into your grandkids. Singles, young adults, like what else you got to do? Got a lot of time on your hand. Let's, let's pour into the youth. Invest. Go to the, the, the youth groups on Wednesday nights, all the fun things that they're a part of. Invest. Pour into. So let's look at these last two verses. Five principles in building a family. I'm going to use the word arrow as a way to kind of keep us on track. A-R-R-O-W. A, first principle, aim. Aim. Look at verse 4. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. So Solomon's painting a word picture. Children are like arrows. An arrow is meant to be aimed at a target. Lots of different kinds of arrows, but they're all designed to hit the bullseye. So what's the bullseye of your family? What's your family aiming for? Right, destination determines direction. What would your kids say? If I were to ask them, what's the aim of your family? How would they respond? What would your kids say is a priority in your family? What does Jesus say in Matthew 6? Hey, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. That's the target, the kingdom of God, his purposes, his righteousness. That's the target. That's the bullseye. Heaven is our home. We're just passing through. So what would your kids say? How do you define success? Right, what would Joshua say? Joshua 24, 15, right? He says, but as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. And so how would you answer that question? As for me and my house, we are going to go fishing every Saturday. Lots of fishing here. As for me and my house, we're going to play baseball. Nothing wrong with that. In Santa Barbara, in fact, it's fall ball in Santa Barbara. Every single game is on a Sunday morning. And it's forcing families to make a decision. What's the aim? As for me and my house, we're going to get a 4.83 GPA. As for me and my house, we're going to take over the family business. As for me and my house, every family needs to answer that question. What's the aim? What's the aim? Now, now don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with passion. There's nothing wrong with the pursuit or, or practicing you know, gymnastics or playing sports. Nothing wrong with that. But every solar system can only have one sun. So what's it going to be for your family? What's the aim? Aim. Seek first the kingdom. R, 
rhythm. Verse 4 again, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Arrows, you know, sticks are not arrows by nature. They have to be made. They have to be shaped and sharpened in order to be shot. Kids will often be a handful before they're a quiverful, right? So, so just, ask, just ask Neil and Cece about that. So, so how do you sharpen your kids? What are the rhythms in your home? What are the right rhythms? How, what are the right routines and habits? What does devotion look like? How are you investing into your children? You know, we have something we call the Wagner Way at our house. We're constantly just trying to think of ways to have the right rhythms in our home. And one of the Wagner Ways is we try to have dinner at least three times a week at the dinner table. I got a 17-year-old daughter who's a senior. I got a 14-year-old son who's a freshman. I got a 12-year-old son uh, who's seventh grade and a nine-year-old son who's fourth grade. So we got a busy household. Lots of things. We play a lot of sports, a lot of things going on. Uh, But a Wagner way, a rhythm of our home, at least three times a week, we're going to sit down at the dinner table and, and have dinner together. Another part of the Wagner Way is uh, we found out, my wife and I, that the morning time was just chaotic, and so we came up with a new phrase. We're going to minimize morning mayhem. Minimize morning mayhem. Now, my three boys say, really, it's called the Ava Alternative. That's my daughter's name, Ava, because Ava needs an alternative way to get ready in the morning. Uh, because pretty much she comes down in a hot mess, ready to roll, and it's just like causes mayhem. So the rhythm of our home, we're trying to figure out how can we minimize morning mayhem. What's it look like? Step number one, we have two stories. Most of the time, my daughter forgets to brush her teeth, so we're putting a toothpaste toothbrush in the bottom downstairs bathroom. We're going to hopefully minimize some morning mayhem, little stuff like that. What are the rhythms in your home? We like to say every day we have a TKO day, thankful, kind, and obedient day. TKO, man, let's knock them out today. Wagner, what are the rhythms in your home? Who's building character into your kids? Who's teaching? Who's pouring into your kids? Who's teaching them things like contentment and courage and courtesy, discernment, fairness, generosity, helpfulness, honesty, humility, kindness, obedience, orderliness, patience, responsibility, self-control, wisdom, Who's building character in your kids? Who are the voices investing in them? Are you complimenting them not just on a good home run, but on a good decision that they made? The rhythms of your home. What are you creating? How are you creating boundaries? I mentioned this on Friday night. In our home, the Wagner Way, we discipline for three, the three Ds. Disobedience, dishonesty, and disrespect. That's the, way, that's the rhythm of our home. That's what we're going to do. Because here's the thing, there's a time when the arrow is in your hand and there's a time when the arrow is out of your hand. Which brings us to point number three, release. Release. Again, verse four. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior. Of a warrior. Arrows are not meant to be collected, but projected. A warrior is going to have to use the arrow. It's an offensive weapon. We have to recognize parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles that God has a unique plan for each child. While kids are a reflection of their parents, they also need to, they're their own individuals with their own unique path, right? You know this, Ephesians 2.10. We are all God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. The arrow goes where the warrior cannot. It's got to be released. So how are you raising your child for when they are released and exiting your home? Pastor John mentioned this on Friday night, I believe. The hardest time of shooting an arrow from a bow is when it's pulled back the tightest, right before it's released. Maybe some of you are sensing that right now. I, my daughter is a senior. We're thinking about college. Let me tell you, that bow is tight, and I'm ready to just release it. <laughs> but where is it aiming? I want to I make sure we're releasing accurately. When we begin as parents, we're their commander. We're telling them what's up. Then we become their coach. We're teaching them. 
Then we become their counselor. We're guiding them. And then we become the consultant, like many of you maybe today. You just say, hey, here I am. Come find me when you need me, you know. So where are you at? Release. Fourth, occupy. Occupy. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them, verse 5. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Enemies at the gate. You know, the gate of a city is where business was done. Leaders of the city, they, they met there. Transactions were completed at the city gate. So Solomon is saying, children are like, they're like arrows. And when you have your quiver full of them, when they're straight and they're sharp and they're sure, they're going to have influence over a city. Amen? Occupy. They're going to occupy. When Jesus was given this parable, he says this in Luke chapter 19. There's a master who gave treasure to his servants. And he said, I'm going to leave, and I want you to occupy until I return. I want you to engage and invest. Don't hide. I know I, you're going to be in the world, not of the world, but in the world. Occupy. You know, Jesus didn't say, I want you guys to all build tree houses and get up there and pull up the ladder and stay and hide up there. No, no, no. He said, occupy. Be in the gate. Influence the city. And I know, I, I feel like we're, as Christian families, I think we're, we've become so afraid that we stay in the greenhouse, if you will. The greenhouse, right? It's, it's a protected environment. You can control the temperature. You can keep the door closed, keep the critters out. It's well watered. The perfect environment for maximum initial growth is in the greenhouse. But... There comes a time when we have to move from the greenhouse to the grove. And the grove is where the real growth happens. It's in the grove that we're planted. It's in the grove that our roots can go down deep and our maximum potential can be realized. And I know it's been hard for me as, as a parent I want my kids to stay in the greenhouse. We were just recently challenged with this. All of our kids have been going to a small private Christian school. But my ninth grade son, he really wanted to play football. And he's like, I really want to go to the public high school, the high school that I went to. Those Pueblos High School, Char let's go, go Chargers. And, uh, and so we were praying. We're like, oh, Lord, this, this is big. You know, you hear all the stuff about public schools. And we were nervous. And we just felt God's peace about it. Okay, this is time. This is time. He's been in the greenhouse. We're going to plant him in the grove. Let's see, let's go, let's go for this. And let me tell you, it's been challenging, but it's been beautiful. It really has been. My little 14-year-old son, he, his faith is blossoming. It's been rad. And I know that can, that's not always the story. I recognize that, but that's our story, and we're excited about that. We feel like the Lord directed us that, so we're here to occupy. Roots grow deep in the grove. Potential is realized in the grove. We can reach our full potential. Bold and brave, occupy till Jesus returns. So let's let our kids be at the gate of this city. The hope of the future is <laughs> in the next generation. They're smarter than us. They're wiser than us. They're braver. They have greater influence than I'm going to have. Right? An arrow goes farther than where I'm standing. That's the point of an arrow. Occupy. Which I encourage you. I think about just Pastor John will mention this in a moment as well, but I do think it's an opportunity we have to vote this, this, this season, to occupy, to exercise your influence in this community. Yes, you're in Florida. You guys are pretty set already. Okay. But, uh, you know, in California, I did voter registration Sunday last, last week, and I just encouraged the church, hey, exercise your, your vote. Let your voice be heard. Let your vo vote be counted. And vote your biblical ideas as closely aligned with biblical values as you can. Occupy until he comes. Aim, rhythm, release, occupy. Finally, walk, walk. We've got to walk it out. We've got to be the right example, church. There's no way faster to raise a rebellious kid than to speak one way on Sunday and live another way on Monday. You gotta walk it out. Grandparents, you gotta walk it out. Aunts and uncles, you gotta walk it out. Parents, you gotta walk it out. How do you walk through 
a prayer you've been praying that seems to go unanswered? How are you walking that out? How are you walking out a failed expectation? You thought this was going to happen and it didn't happen. How are you walking that out? How are you walking out um, uh, friendships that, that are, are tense? How, how, how are you walking out um, families that, that are going through a, a divorce? Like how, how, are you, how are you walking this out? Kids are absorbing all of this. They're watching. Failure, repentance, these are huge lessons to teach. Don't have to be perfect. We just need to be authentic. The Lord gives rest to those who trust. Maybe this is an area where you need to have greater trust. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your kids. Maybe you have a prodigal right now. And, and you just need to trust the Lord. Lord, I... I, I I'm, I've been eating the bread of anxious toil over my prodigal son and daughter. And it's tearing me up. And I just need to trust you. Maybe there's an area of your life where you've been clinging on too tightly. Maybe it is in the area of business. Maybe you are starting your own business and, and it's like you're, you're like, Ken, you're just thinking about it all the time. Maybe you're clinging on so you're like white knuckling it. Maybe today the Lord's just telling you, trust, trust me. Unless the Lord is in it, it's useless to build it. Is the Lord in it? Maybe you've got to ask yourself that question today. Maybe as you're thinking about these five principles, aim and rhythm and release, maybe you have been convicted, what is the aim of your family? Maybe your kids would have a different answer than you think they would. I'm just so confident that although the past few moments uh, we've been speaking in a corporate setting, but I believe the Holy Spirit has spoken to individual hearts today. And uh, as we always love to end our service, there'll be some worship. Um, a little bit later, the prayer team will be around, and maybe there's some things you need, you need to bring to the altar today. Uh, maybe, maybe all your response today is in worship is just to, just to open your hands. And just say, Lord, I've been holding on too tight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you. The Lord gives rest to those who trust.